This episode is sponsored by The Jordan Harbinger Show, a podcast you should definitely check out. I enjoy the show, and I think you will as well. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's Jordan, H-A-R, binge R, in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening now. Welcome to Future Hindsight, a podcast that takes big ideas about civic life and democracy and turns them into action items for you and me. I'm Mila Atmos. We're going to try to make sense of the midterms on this week's show. And before you skip because it's early December and, my God, you've heard enough midterm analysis to last a lifetime, we are going to do this the Future Hindsight way. We are not about the horse race on this show. This podcast is about what we can do, you and me, to contribute to a healthy democracy and civic life in general that is more than voting and less than running for office. And so with that proposition firmly in mind, I want to welcome this week's guest who has for decades looked above and beyond horse race politics and worked for a stronger, more inclusive democracy. Cecile Richards is one of the most insightful non-politicians I know, an icon of civic engagement. She's the co-chair of American Bridge, former president of Planned Parenthood, a co-founder of Supermajority, and author of the book Make Trouble. Welcome to Future Hindsight. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me, Mila. So it feels as though this election was really at the crossroads of your life's work between voting and abortion rights. In the run-up to the midterms, we heard the drumbeat of Look out for November. How do you think reproductive justice played out? Well, it is interesting, and I feel very fortunate that we're having this conversation after the election because so many of the professional prognosticators were completely wrong on what happened. And actually, a a guy I follow a lot, Tom Bonier, who really actually was right on all the way up and kept saying the polls were wrong, said, you know, it really wasn't a red wave. It was a row wave. And I think that sort of just captures it in a nutshell. Because what we had seen, of course, earlier in the year in the state of Kansas, where, you know, a very, very red state overwhelmingly defeated the efforts to restrict abortion access. And we saw it, of course, continuing on in special elections, particularly the one in Alaska. It really held true. And it's interesting because, of course, the way I think about the issue of access to safe and legal abortion or reproductive health care or health care at all is it's really not a political issue because it affects everyone. This is not something that, you know, only Democrats or only independents or only Republicans care about. The ability to make decisions about pregnancy transcend every single area uh, of our lives. And that's what I think we saw uh, in the November elections. Mm -hmm. So, well, this is the first post-Dobbs general election. Do you see abortion rights continuing to be an organizing force? I absolutely do. And in fact, it's been interesting to see after this really kind of shellacking (laughs) that the Republican Party got – And clearly, this was such a motivating issue. I mean, a couple of the key states, of course, that everyone had been following, Michigan and Pennsylvania, where this was, if not the the most important issue, one of the top two issues for people in terms of motivation to vote and how they were going to vote. It's been fascinating to see that, by and large, the Republican Party has said, oh, no, that's not what this was about at all. Uh, They've sort of, I think, tried to say this was a rejection of Donald Trump. Well, honestly, Donald Trump wasn't on the ballot. Um, What was on the ballot were a number of politicians who had hewed to the the Republican Party line, which is we want to ban all safe and legal abortion. So I say that in that I don't believe that the Republican Party is going to change. They are now kind of caught in this situation where they have empowered what I believe is really the extreme wing of their party on this issue. So they're not going to be able to to backtrack. And as disturbingly, we are now seeing, of course, the impact of what it means to live in a country or live in a state where you no longer can make decisions about your pregnancy. I mean, really tragic stories, as well as everyday stories. And that isn't going to get better. I was just reading, you know, as we look at the states starting up in January with the state legislative sessions, the ones where the Republicans won majorities in their state legislature, they're going to keep going. They're going to try to ban abortion even more fully. And I think in states like Florida, 
And so this issue is going to continue to be very much in the minds of the American voters. Right. Who knew, like 50 years after Roe was decided, that we would be in these real battles for this very basic freedom for all for all families, really, right? For like, everyone. Because for everyone. And, no, and, and it is interesting. I mean, you know, young people definitely surged in terms of turnout, very progressive. This was the number one issue on college campuses was access to safe and legal abortion. And also because I believe that young people, like a lot of Americans, see this as more than abortion. It is about do you have rights to make your own decisions, whether it's about your body, about who you love, who you marry, et cetera, Or is that something that the government is going to control? And this whole idea of losing freedom is very, very powerful with all voters, but particularly with young voters. Mm -hmm. Well, it was definitely animating in places where abortion was actually on the ballot. And so how do we carry that forward? Should we be looking to codify abortion rights through ballot measures everywhere in every state? Well, I I mean, I guess I'm of two minds. Yes, of course, we should try to get this into every constitution that we possibly can. And I believe there are states like New Mexico, others where I think they'll now move to do that. But of course, it doesn't solve the basic problem. You know, I come from Texas where access to safe and legal abortion ended basically about a year ago. And the stories out of Texas of doctors, healthcare providers, women, families are really tragic. And so it isn't going to really help the people of Texas if we codify abortion rights into half the country and the other half is left behind. This has to be taken on at the national level. So I think it's going to be a both and. So one of the things we miss when we discuss elections and politics as strictly a horse race is I think we miss the continuum right? Like that elections are actually not simple referenda. They're woven in with movements and long, slow, hard work organizing. There are consequences of what your party has been standing for or standing by and allowing for a long time. In that context, I wanted to ask you about your work over the years with Planned Parenthood and now with American Bridge. How did you see that history of organizing playing out in this election? It's a great question, Mila, because I think Often, after an election, the analysis is very superficial. It is, you know, well, there was this moment in time and there were these certain ads or this certain candidate or this certain press release or speech, and that somehow is what made all the things happen. I actually believe that what happened, and this election is a perfect example, we saw the evidence, and I could name state after state, where it was the fact that people were on the ground. They were on college campuses. Folks were organizing women, as we do through supermajority, you know, whether it was Planned Parenthood, whether it were labor unions, folks who were actually talking to their members, registering new people to vote, turning them out to vote. That's what makes the difference. And that, of course, is what builds a democracy. Because as you say, an election is just sort of a moment in time. And, you know, sometimes it's a door you have to kick open. And sometimes there's a door you get to walk through. At this time, I hope we're more in the walk through uh, place. But it's also an opportunity to take all these millions of people who voted, many for the first time, and say, now you have the chance to make a difference. Now you have the chance to work with a, a United States Senate that actually cares about climate change, that cares about voting rights, that cares about reproductive health care access, on and on and on. And that, to me, is the magic of organizing, is that government has the most impact on people's lives of anything else, any other institution. And so the idea of being part of a, not a, you know, kind of build it up, burn it down cycle of election to election, but a through line of organizing is really what what makes our democracy strong. And, And that's how things change. Of course, having been in the working, whether it's on labor rights or environmental rights or women's rights or LGBTQ rights, whatever, you know, you're going to lose more than you're going to win. But it takes that steady organizing year after year after year. And then sometimes you win and it's amazing. (laughs) Yes. I think the grassroots is so important. I just kind of feel like 
people talk about it in every election cycle, you know, doing the organizing on the ground. And then they stop talking about it until the next election. Right. But if you're stopping it, to your point, like you can't you can't do that. You just have to keep going and have right. the thread continuously in front of you with the people who are there. But that's very hard work. I mean, you it know, is. that takes a dedicated right. caterer of people who are like, we're going to do this and we're going to keep doing it. Well, a great example that I've just been so impressed by this election was the state of Wisconsin, where a young man, Ben Wickler, decided a few years ago to go back home, as he said, you know, to Wisconsin and really rebuild the state Democratic Party. And they built an amazing operation uh, of both voter registration, turning people out to door knock, doing the things that are very old fashioned. They're not about TV ads, but they are about actually listening to voters, uh, talking to voters. And I saw a number that Ben posted after this election that from 2018 to 2022, they had a 20 percent increase in young people registered to vote. Now, that doesn't just happen. Young people don't just somehow find their way to voter registration, and particularly in states where they make it hard. But that's really impressive. That's where you can say that is a result of hard work. That's a, that's a result of organizing, making people feel like voting matters, that it's fun, that there are other people doing it. So I think that that state is a really excellent example of how this um, it pays off huge dividends. And then, of course, as we know, Young voters, if they vote in two elections, they become lifelong voters. So getting them at the beginning and, you know, keeping them going is really important. Right, right. Well, that makes me think of uh, Anat Shankar Osorio when we interviewed her about voters and getting people out to vote. She said it was tautological, you know. The people who vote vote, and the people who don't vote don't vote. And it's like, oh, no, <laughs> how, do we, how do we short-circuit this vicious cycle? But... Anyway, let's keep the focus on the states. Having talked about Wisconsin, let's also talk about Michigan. What can we learn from that state's example in terms of building power at the state level? Well, I mean, Michigan, again, I think if anyone is sort of looking at what happened this election, it is the absolute test case, particularly with regard to reproductive rights. Because, of course, not only did we have all these really critical statewide races, but we had a ballot initiative that was poised to enshrine the right to safe and legal abortion in the state. That was overwhelmingly passed by the voters. But as well, Governor Gretchen Whitmer was in what was supposed to be a very close race. People didn't know how it was going to go. Won overwhelmingly. So did Jocelyn Benson, the Secretary of State, who has been such an advocate for improving access to voting and making it easier for folks. Dana Nessel, the Attorney General. These were all really, really tough races. And I remember when I was out in Michigan this summer to do a fundraiser for the ballot initiative, I guess just as one, I hate to use too many numbers, but I think this was this is one that I'll just never forget because it was so overwhelming. You know, there had been discussion out there about putting a ballot initiative on, but you have to get a certain number of signatures in in the state to do that. After the Dobbs decision, 750,000 people signed petitions in order to put it on the ballot. Now, that's a lot. And that is, I mean, actually, they get sort of set a record in Michigan. And then, of course, those folks are motivated to vote because they've now actually done something even harder, really, which is to put their name on something saying, I want this on the ballot. And to me, the organizing that happened in that campaign alongside the governor's race, et cetera, was really, really critical. And Michigan now, I mean, they flipped the legislature. It is a state where the the energy that we saw, again, among young people, women, folks who don't always vote in midterm elections was enormous. And again, I think it's the power. I mean, I I suppose that's what we're talking about here, which is, you know, some people go out and vote because it's their their democratic duty or that's just what they do and their parents always voted, so they always vote. But a lot of people don't vote because they actually don't know why it matters. And look, especially for folks who – you know, I think of students or, you know, moms or people who are working two jobs, folks who can't just take off and go vote. It's not always easy. And of course, unfortunately, in some of the states that we've talked about, they've made it even harder. Having issues on the ballot where people go, I actually know why I'm going to vote. That can be a game changer. In fact, we talked about Kansas briefly, but that was an election where, I mean, I just have to say it was the Republican Party that put that on the ballot. They put it on the ballot in like 
the first week of August when, of course, kids are out of school, folks are on vacation. It was a completely inconvenient time to go vote. Folks thought no one would go vote. In fact, they had record turnout in Kansas. And it was actually closer to presidential year turnout. And 20 percent of the people that voted in that election only came out to vote on the ballot initiative. They didn't even vote on the other races. So again, I think it's just an interesting use of an issue that people feel passionately about that helps drive them to participate in democracy and voting. You you asked earlier, will we see this in other states? I think we will. Of course, not every state allows for ballot initiatives, but I do think there is now going to be a um, as kind of a surge. In fact, this was wild. Mila, you probably already know this, but there were six ballot initiatives on abortion this year in 2022. In the red states, in the blue states like California, Vermont, every single one of them, the side that won was the side that was in in favor of abortion rights. And that includes Montana, Kentucky, Kansas. I just think it's a sign of how out of step candidates and politicians who want to ban abortion, how out of step they are with where the American people are. Yeah, I think this uh, one of the things that it really was a big takeaway for me in the midterm election, which is something that I've been saying for a long time, and people, I think, don't want to believe it. I said the American electorate, I think, is surprisingly astute and, you know, really can divine the difference between what's good for them as everyday people and what's not good for them, especially when it comes to freedoms and rights. And I, and I think mm-hmm. they understand that democracy is at risk. They understand that if you take rights away like this, that it affects everything, you know, your entire mm-hmm. life, not just sort of like this one random right. random thing. You know? Right. And it's, and it's not about a constitutional issue anymore, which is where, again, I think that the Republican Party just sort of can't read the room here. People don't think of abortion and decisions about pregnancy as political. They mm-hmm. think of them as deeply personal. Mm-hmm. And we know, I mean, you know, you can read any day, you know, interviews with voters about why they voted the way they did. And as you said, people can hold more than one idea in their head at the same time. People can have their own strong feelings about what they would do in the case, for example, of an unintended pregnancy. But they also can believe it is not something they want to make a decision about for every other person in America. And that, you know, the years I was at Planned Parenthood, we had these kinds of ballot initiatives come up. I remember particularly in South Dakota, which is a very conservative state where the legislature tried to ban abortion. And we took it to the ballot twice. And the voters of South Dakota just overwhelmingly voted down an abortion ban in their state. And Again, I just think it is mixing politics with something that is actually not about politics for the average American. I have been struck by the number of people, maybe because of my age too, who uh, have kids who are trying to get pregnant. I've talked to so many people, men and women, who say, look, I just want a healthy grandchild. That is the most important thing to me. And you can see how they're they're shifting in their, their politics and their voting because – The thought that anyone would come between their child, their family, and a healthy pregnancy is – it's unthinkable. And we're going to see that more and more. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Well, just as an aside on ballot initiatives, we had Katie Fahey on the show earlier Mm -hmm. this year. You know, she spearheaded the anti-gerrymander ballot initiative in Michigan, the uh, nonpartisan redistricting which is a crucial part of the story that preceded this election. And we're actually going to dig in more on ballot initiatives uh, next week with Chris Melody Fields Figueredo. She's the executive director of the Ballot Initiative Strategy Center. Great. Yeah, so we're going to do more on that. But I want to circle back here on abortion. It was so significant. And yet, uh, I mean, what the hell? (laughs) 8% more white women voted for Republicans in this election. And and what do you see in that statistic? When you read that, what are you thinking? Well, I mean, again, it varies state by state. But, you know, white women have voted for Republicans now for a while. Well, before we talk about white women, we should say that the number one most progressive voters in this country for decades have been black women. And so before we talk about the problems we've got with white women, I also have to acknowledge, you know, in any victory that we have as progressive candidates in America, black women are at the core. And obviously in each state, you know, voter turnout and whatever uh, differs. But I do believe, and this is part of why we started Supermajority as a multiracial organization of women, 
we have to be talking across race, across generation, across geography about the fundamental values we all hold because we need more white women to vote with us. And I think it's going to be a forever pursuit. Obviously, we need more white men to vote with us and they overwhelmingly don't vote with us. You know, I think it's interesting. A lot of times after elections, people will say, well, why are folks voting against their self-interest? Which I personally find not a helpful frame because sometimes people are voting and they have a complex series of things that motivate them. Sometimes it's cultural. Sometimes it is tribal. And so what we have to do is be in conversation with all people, but including women, including white women, because we need to bring more more of them with us. I know folks are, are sort of trying to diagnose the John Fetterman phenomena in in Pennsylvania because, again, a race that was supposed to be really, you know, nearly impossible. He ended up winning. And, of course, part of what, how he won is he just went everywhere. And, of course, I love John Fetterman's slogan, every county, every vote, which really spoke to we're not writing anybody off and we want to be in conversation with everyone it's actually kind of interesting because it's it is a piece of what American Bridge really has specialized in, which is recognizing that there are counties where Democrats are not going to win uh, because just for the numbers and but there are counties where we can do better. And I, I think we've seen that and we certainly saw it in the presidential election in our work in, in Pennsylvania and Wisconsin and Michigan. It means going out and knocking on doors and communicating with folks who really are more open to us than I think we believe. And again, John Fetterman really, really demonstrated that this this election cycle. Yeah, he did. I mean, he went to every, every county. He listened to people. And I think sometimes as progressives, we're just frustrated that people don't get it. We go like, why don't they understand why everything we believe is better for them? You know, fill in the blank. And, you know, my mom, who was really smart, you know, politically, she would say, you know, people don't do things for your reasons. They do things for their own reasons. And I think part of this is we have to be in conversation with folks and understand them and be empathetic and also I mean, stand our ground for sure. A very good example to me was for years, you know, when I was at Planned Parenthood, people kind of got lumped into two categories. You're either pro-choice or pro-life, labels which were completely irrelevant to the average American person. In fact, if you went into a focus group and asked someone to choose, they would just want to like recede into the corner. Um, And so when we quit using these labels and quit kind of talking past people, we actually found there were the vast majority of people believed that decisions about abortion, pregnancy should be made by the person who's pregnant, not by government. But that took being in conversation and listening to people and honestly having some empathy or having a great deal of empathy about where they're coming from. And we just need more of that in politics. And that's what I think, again, one really positive sign out of this election is really a wholesale rejection of this sort of demonization politics, which I saw being run against many of our candidates. People don't like it. And I think we can learn a lot from this cycle. Yeah. I think people are also just so burned out, right, from the demonization, this yeah. huge, long cycle, Ugly. which is, say, many years now that has just been turbocharged over the years more and more to the point where people don't recognize each other and or themselves in some cases. Yeah, or the humanity of people. I will be interested post-election as everyone starts sifting through the wreckage here. But, you know, the attack on Paul Pelosi, which happened, of course, just days before the midterm elections, and the reaction of some people in office was so horrifying and dehumanizing. And that's just not who we want to be, I believe. In fact, I was looking back when Representative Congressman Scalise was shot at the baseball game. I don't know if you remember this, but this has been about five years ago. And there was a joint statement immediately by Nancy Pelosi and Paul Ryan, the respective leaders of their parties in Congress, saying an attack on any of any one of us is an attack on all of us. And it was such a sign of solidarity. You didn't see any of that happen when Paul Pelosi was attacked or obviously in, in lieu of his wife, Nancy Pelosi. I hope someone learned something from this, that we can disagree uh, about issues. We can disagree about the direction we think we should be taking politically. But that sort of dehumanization of others 
It was horrifying to see. We're taking a break for a quick word about our sponsor. Thanks to The Jordan Harbinger Show for supporting Future Hindsight. The Jordan Harbinger Show combines in-depth interviews with some of the world's most fascinating minds like Arthur Brooks and Barbara Boxer. You always learn useful advice from Jordan's heavy-hitting interviews. In his conversation with Arthur Brooks, they discuss why happiness relies on being mindful of what you have right now instead of comparing yourself to others who have what you want. They also talk about how gratitude can be used as an anesthetic for contempt and what the kind of leader we have tells us about the kind of society we're living in. And that's just the beginning. Beyond the interviews, Jordan's Feedback Friday episodes respond to listener questions about everything from conventional conundrums like asking for a raise at work to doozies like helping a family member escape a cult. Whether Jordan is conducting an interview or giving advice to a listener, you'll find something useful that you can apply to your own life. That could mean learning how to ask for advice the right way, or it could just be discovering a slight mindset tweak that changes how you see the world. Search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's Jordan, H-A-R, binge R, in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening now. And now, let's return to my conversation with Cecile Richards. I have to chuckle now thinking about some of the reactions coming from some voices on the right about having so comprehensively lost the young and single women vote, you know, and that the solution for them is to get married because then they'll vote Republican. Is this, (laughs) I mean, or that's that's their hypothesis, right? But like, is this generational shift permanent? And what do progressives need to deliver to maintain this kind of support from young people and single women? I have believed, really believed this when I was at Planned Parenthood. It's one of the reasons we invested so heavily in bringing in a whole new generation of leadership is that that young people are the most diverse racially. They're the most progressive. They are have the you know, sort of most open views about opportunity and equity. And so the more we can bring in as voters and engaged citizens, the better for our democracy. And I believe that the Republican Party, which is now the party, you know, that doesn't believe in climate change, that is very weak on LGBTQ rights, obviously, depending on who the candidate is, have taken a strong stand on ending all access to safe and legal abortion, have tried to do everything they can to limit the ability of people to vote and participate. Just go down the list. This is a shrinking pool of voters in this country. And maybe the Dobbs decision, just because it is so stark, is the best example. But I believe they are on the verge of losing an entire generation of voters. It's just very hard to come back from this. So that's where I feel like the Republican Party is is sort of, I, I don't know what they're thinking, how they're going to grow. But I do believe as well, we have to be really diligent in continuing to be in conversation with young voters because they're also going to get their hearts broken by all the things that they voted for that aren't going to happen, right? And I was just actually... I just did a, a panel with the first Gen Z member of Congress coming from Florida, and we were talking about this. How is he going to keep his his constituents engaged? And he said by being really honest, not by promising all of the things, but saying, in fact, this is long-term fight for the things we believe in and allowing people to be participants in that and engaged in that as opposed to just thinking you vote and then you go home and wait for someone to deliver the goods. So that, to me, it kind of gets back to your earlier point, Mila, about organizing and why grassroots organizing is so important, is that unless people feel like they're involved in the process outside of election times, it's very hard because otherwise people just think, well, government's no good. But in fact, government is us, you know, and all these good folks we just elected across the country – They're only going to be as good as the rest of us are on the outside organizing to support them in doing the right thing. Right. Well, I want to turn to the big overarching questions about democracy. Election deniers lost their bids for secretary of state races. Yeah. But not so much in the House. So it feels like we in some ways dodged a bullet, but there are still some serious anti-democracy folks heading to Washington. Right. So we're not really in the clear 
What do we need to be aware of and working on when it comes to the House and the Senate? Well, first, I think just to to take a beat on your point, this is actually something that American Bridge worked on, which we hadn't before, and that was making sure that we were educating voters about candidates for secretary of state in particular, because for the first time we had people running for office who did not believe in certifying elections, candidates that were so far out of the mainstream. And so in really key races, um, Arizona probably being the best example, I mean, I'm just grateful now that the work happened that did and that voters were paying enough attention because it's really hard to get people to like focus on anything below the top of the ticket. Nevada, the same thing. These are states that could be critical in even having a fair election, whichever way it goes next time around. So doing that work at the state level is going to continue to be important. I also think we have seen an opening here, which I don't think we all expected, and that is that calling out people who want to really end democracy and move to an authoritarian government, this is not popular and that people are willing to pay attention. You know, President Biden made a really important speech just a few days before the election on this whole question of democracy. It was much more important than I realized at the time. I think we underestimate how much the voters can appreciate that people who just want to tear the whole system down are dangerous in this country. And so even as this new class gets in, it's going to be interesting to see where the Republican Party stands because their caucus is now going to be, has been infiltrated or is filling up with people who don't believe in democracy. So it's going to be really interesting to see how the new speaker deals with these kinds of public attacks on on democracy. I feel like the Democrats have been very clear. I feel like the hearings about January 6th have been really important in exposing this danger in our democracy. But you're right. The work is far from done. There is a vocal, engaged caucus, certainly in Congress, and they are going to have to be reckoned with. This is a time I just believe that there have to be some adults in the Republican Party who stand up and say, this is not who we are. Mm -hmm. But that has not happened yet. It hasn't. I mean, I don't know if it will. (laughs) But speaking of the voters, and you just said, of course, that on the state level, secretaries of state who were election deniers and were not willing to certify elections have lost, which is a huge, huge victory for democracy. But so what does it tell you about the MAGA voter and Trumpism? To me, this was in a referendum not on MAGA, not on Trump. This was a referendum on the Republican Party and the extremists in the Republican Party. People want to say this election was about a rejection of Trump, but he wasn't on the ballot. And the Republicans that were on the ballot, uh, certainly in the case of abortion, they were hewing to the party line. In fact, it's kind of interesting now to see, you know, specifically in the state of Michigan, where the Republican Party is now going after their own nominee, But she was saying exactly what the Republican Party told her to say. This is their position. They did not moderate their position. And there's no indication that they're going to. Trump is obviously extremely unpopular. And having his endorsement did not help people. The Republican Party nominated folks who were, in my opinion, completely unqualified for office. And thank goodness the American people were paying attention. I mean, we're not out of this yet. Um, We obviously have a really important runoff in Georgia, where I think this is kind of a classic case. But I I do think it shows that voters, and certainly independent voters, are willing to cross party lines when their party becomes so extreme. But I think this presidential election is going to be fascinating. If former President Trump runs again, this is going to be a moment for the, all the Republicans who say they don't like him, who say they don't agree with him, but who have done nothing to stop him. This is going to be their chance. Yeah. Well, if they <laughs> if they have the courage to do that, because right. I think they're still doing the calculations in their minds, like which one is going to pan out. And it's really just about winning power. But well, that's I, what I mean, I think that is what is so, so um, horrifying. Is right. It is so, so blatantly just about a power grab. But I mean, that would be a whole nother episode. Oh, well, <laughs> yes, it would be. It would be. But I just wanted to add here, of course, that I think people 
everyday people are just exhausted by the yes. extremism. And Tim Ryan, he didn't win, of course, in Ohio, right. but he did say he's part of the exhausted majority. And when he right. said that, I felt like, yeah, me too. Yeah. You know, just make it stop. You know, we just right. want regular politics where people are centering the people and good governance as opposed to having power. Right. Look, I mean, that was about, you know, two years ago. That was what we were concerned at at American Bridge is that, we, you know, we had polled women after the election, after Joe Biden was elected, and they just said, I've had enough. I mean, between COVID and four years of Donald Trump, I think 51 percent said they're paying less attention to politics. And so that was a huge barrier thinking about the midterm elections is just that women were going to stay home. Again, that's what the Dobbs decision did. It completely changed the dynamic of this election because not only it energized people who were worn out, who thought, OK, no, I'm not going to sit back while this happens. And of course, I think it also persuaded independent women in particular to cross party lines. In fact, I was I saw the numbers in Pennsylvania, incoming Senator Fetterman I think he got two-thirds of the independent women vote, which is really high. And I think that's the main reason. Yeah. Well, that's very, very encouraging that independents are voting in this way. And yet, though, I think there's still a lot of voter apathy. You're from Texas, right? And I focus a lot of time on the races in Texas Mm -hmm. in the run-up to this election. And I think it was really interesting in terms of turnout, kind of contrary to the emergent national narrative of independent voters splitting for Democrats and women and youth driving results in Texas We saw a lot of tribalism and apathy, low voter turnout, uh, you know, below expectations for both parties and just kind of voting for Republicans, even in places like Uvalde. Mm -hmm. So what are the lessons we need to take from that specific state? Because the the abortion ban did not turn the tide there. And I I was very surprised by that. I mean, it's so a couple of things that are important, although. I want to acknowledge we didn't win, and many of us will spend the rest of our lives <laughs> trying to win that state. And I, I have to acknowledge the work of Beto O'Rourke and the other statewide candidates who, I mean, they left it all in the field. They did not just dial this in. They were out there, and Beto, much like John Fetterman, was out in every county. Uh, so a couple of observations. One is Greg Abbott did worse than he's ever done in a statewide election. So each year, it's just sort of steady progress. And in a, in a state where we haven't elected a Democrat statewide in 30 years, that's just what it takes. We just have to keep showing up and keep moving the needle. The second thing that happened is that despite all the gerrymandering that the Republicans did in Texas, it is one of the most gerrymandered states. They picked up, I think, one seat in the state house, and the Rio Grande border, the Rio Grande Valley, where they had completely redrawn these congressional districts, they were not able to sweep those either. So I feel like we were able to put the you know the blocks and the stoppers out on a Republican just sort of landslide in those important areas. Third, Lena Hidalgo, who was the most targeted Democrat, the county judge of Harris County, they dumped millions of dollars against her very negative. She won that race. And Latino voters in the state did not defect in this wholesale way that the Republicans had predicted and in which they still claim. And it's it's simply not true. So I feel like all the pieces are there for Democrats. It's just going to take a while. Also, I, I have to say, and I have not looked at all of the numbers yet, we make it really hard to vote in Texas, right? Texas is also a state that has perfected voter suppression. So I don't want to make any broad conclusions about all the impacts that it had on voter turnout in this election, but it is a state where the Republican Party has been hell-bent for my entire lifetime on preventing people to vote. When I was a kid, it was a poll tax, right? It was forcing people to pay a poll tax um, or literacy exams. Now it is making it hard and, you know, disqualifying people, on and on and on. And so this is what makes me most fearful about democracy is this Supreme Court that will not stand in the way of the abuses on voter participation, which are just fundamental. Yeah, that's right. So that's all I got on Texas. I don't know. But (laughs) I'm never giving up. We're never giving up. Yes, we're not giving up. And I like that you are calling out the victories in there and, and just, you know, making sure we understand that it's not, it was not a blowout in the way that people predicted, for sure. Well, this leads me, of course, to my next 
question, which is about the red wave. That wasn't, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Everybody said it was going to be like this. And uh, again, I don't want to go into the horse races, but there's something here for engaged t- citizens, right. I think, to think about. We are yet again in the part of the post-election debrief where the punditocracy unironically hollers that the media got it wrong and the polls were all wrong. So, my question is, do those narratives actually affect voters and mm-hmm. turnout? And and maybe we need to rethink polling because, you know, a Gen Z would rather self-immolate than pick up a call from an unknown number. Right, right. Well, look, I'm no polling expert, but I will say this one, there was a concerted effort that was called out. People sort of saw it happening to flood the zone, if you will, with sort of pseudo really Republican-driven polls. And it did psych people out. I believe it does have an impact. It has an impact on people making contributions to candidates. It has an impact on people uh, participating and continuing to block walk. And so I don't think it's an insignificant matter. And as we know, I mean, that is a way to suppress democracy is by telling people it doesn't matter. There's a red wave. You're done. Your candidate's going to lose, et cetera. And thank goodness, People didn't listen and just kept on going. I also think there is, this will shock you, I think there is an element of sexism in this in that I was on many different panels and shows with certain political prognosticators who would say, well, you know, women cared about the Dobbs decision right after it, but n- now they, you know, sort of like, oh, those whiny women, you know, that that kind of went away. And of course, it didn't go away at all. And in fact, it's to me now embedded in our democracy. My biggest concern when Dobbs was o- overturned was that one, it would take a while for people to figure out what had happened. Well, it didn't because it, it went into effect so quickly. And two, that people really wouldn't know who did it to them. I think that's very clear, the American voters, it's very clear who did this to them, that this was not like the Supreme Court. This was the Republican Party. But I do think there was a, a fair amount of dismissing of the concerns of women voters saying, you know, it's not such a big deal. And again, I think it was a big deal. And I think we can't make that mistake again because I think it's going to be a big deal in 2024 as well. Oh, yeah, for sure. I mean, to your point about the sexism, I saw somebody on TV saying something like, oh, yeah, the women just went crazy. And I thought, no, we didn't go crazy. We, <laughs> You know, what right. is that to say? To go voting is a crazy thing to do. That's just that's just wrong. But it was right. one it's of the, like we're hysterical. We're yes. overly emotional. It was like, like, well, once you can get pregnant, you know, we'll have that conversation. And right. the, that, I, I think, is something we haven't done enough about, really, Mila. And I think now we'll begin to come out, which is... Lifting up the stories, not just the tragic stories of which we saw some in this election of, you know, whether it's a 10-year-old girl or whether it is a, you know, a extremely complicated medical emergency and not being able to get health care. I believe we have got to lift up the just everyday stories of people who get pregnant and don't want to be. And that is the human experience. And the barriers that we have now or some politicians have now put in place for them to be able to make their own decisions. You know, one of the most striking stories to me of this last few months was, in fact, in the state of Ohio, there was a big cover story in the New York Times about the Cleveland Clinic, which is, you know, of course, one of the most renowned health healthcare institutions in the country. And they have a specialty in complex maternal health the doctor's just talking about what it is like to be a doctor who's trained in complex pregnancies and literally not be able to take care of your patients. That is not a Democratic issue. That is not a Republican issue. That is an everybody issue. And, you know, all of the cascading impacts, whether it is brain drain of physicians no longer wanting to do their residencies in states that have abortion bans, whether it's students, undergraduates, graduate students, not wanting to go to go to school in a state where they don't have rights. And we're already reading about women who are saying, I'm not going to take a job if it's in a state where I can't make my own decisions about my body. I feel like the bricks are going to start falling in place here of what it really means to have taken away a fundamental right of people. And it's going to be complicated and it's going to affect everybody. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's going to continue to to be in future elections until we can hopefully fix it. So looking to 2024, what are your goals and what are you focusing on? Well, I mean, 2024 is going to be obviously 
such an important year in terms of the presidency. I also think it's going to be an important year, as you mentioned earlier, in many of these states to begin to show progress. So when you win in a state like Michigan or Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, what are the things that we can do as grassroots activists to ensure that we keep going? And the good thing is I think people fought so hard for these elections that there is a now an engaged body of folks that want to see change. So that's going to be really important as well. And I think we have to I do believe on the issue of reproductive health care and reproductive freedom. We have to lift up the stories of people. We cannot let this issue sort of go away in the sense of, you know, it's easy. The media, they got to keep getting eyeballs. So sometimes they just sort of like lose stories. There are certain reporters, though, certain TV reporters, who I will say, like Nicole Wallace, who has relentlessly lifted these stories up. And I think that's just going to be so critical. But it. It's also lifting up again, not the maybe some of the more extreme cases, but really the everyday cases. I was talking to a, a minister the other day in Dallas, and he said, you know, because they did a lot of ministry for women in particular who needed to get to New Mexico to terminate their pregnancies once it became illegal in Texas. But then everything got criminalized. And he said, you know, I, I worry now. It's not the stories we hear. It's all the stories we don't hear anymore, right? Because everything has sort of gone underground. And so I think it's incumbent on all of us to make sure we're shining a light on not just the people who can get in the press, but the many, many people whose lives have been wrecked by these abortion bans. So those are some things I'm focused on. And then I think just making sure that we continue to invest in young people and women voters because that's sort of the key to most our success. But I got to tell you, I am so pumped (laughs) after this. I mean, this was a hard couple of years. And it really, to me, the lessons are organizing works and that investing now, investing early, don't wait till two months before an election, investing now pays enormous dividends. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Definitely. We are seeing it. And like you said, I think people are not going to let up Right. Uh, between now and the the big general election in 2024. I sure hope not. I sure hope not. <laughs> so you've had so many years of organizing under your belt, and you have mentored so many women. Um, and I've, I want to give you an opportunity to shout out the women who you are passing the baton to. I mean, and you're still, you know, knee-deep in everything. But you were just saying about young people and women. And so right. who are the people who are doing good work that we should be looking out for? I mean, there's so many. Obviously, at Planned Parenthood, you know, the new president there, Alexis McGill Johnson, is fabulous. She was a board member while I was there. She's been a lifelong social justice advocate. Minnie Timaraju, who also worked for me at Planned Parenthood, now heading up NARAL, Pro-Choice America. Minnie is such a talent. I'm just so excited about her. LaFonza Butler, also a friend. I used to be a, a labor organizer at SEIU. That's where she comes out of, the Service Employees Union. LaFonza's doing amazing work. I mean, there are just so many women running really important organizations. The organization I helped co-found, Supermajority, being run by Amanda Brown Learman and a whole host of other um, talented women. I just spoke at a, on a panel, uh, and it's funny, I guess, because I have been doing this forever, you know, I I ran into Blair Amani, who now is just such a superstar. I remember we were talking, her first job, I think, was at Planned Parenthood with me. And I remember she was saying, you know, I got arrested down in Louisiana. And I remember you called me and said, if you need bail money or whatever you need, you tell me. And I was like, okay, here's this young woman at that age. And now she's like her own big, big thing, an author, a speaker, organizer. Anna Eskamani was a young organizer for Planned Parenthood, now serves in the Tallahassee legislature and is just a rock star. Lena Hidalgo, who I've been so happy to support. Anyway, I could go on and on and <laughs> That's on. Great. But I do think it's like that is the thing is anyone who's feeling sort of low or down, just check into some of these young women who are they're just doing it. You know, I'm glad you mentioned Texas because it's easy to go, oh, Texas, you know, what are we going to do? But then I look at the young women, and not just young women, young people of color, young progressive men who are in the state legislature. And you know what they're going to do this next spring? They're going to go toe-to-toe with the people that are trying to take away every right we have, whether it's attacking transgender children and their families, whether it's, you know, restrictions on contraception, LGBTQ rights, you name it. 
those are the people that I just am so inspired by because they don't have the luxury of being discouraged. They every day get up, put on their clothes, get out there and fight the good fight. And 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 they're all over the country. Mm, that's true. That's yeah. true. So looking into the future, what makes you hopeful? Well, I mean, really that. I mean, today what makes me hopeful is that an election which could have gone really, really badly. And I don't mean in a partisan, as you said, not like a horse race kind of way, but where we really were poised to potentially elect people who did not believe in democracy, who were willing to do anything and say anything to get power. They were largely defeated by the American people. And again, not because of any slick TV ads, but by literally talking to the American people. And so to me, this election, more than anything else, was about preserving our democracy and believing that as a country, we can come together and move forward. That really gives me enormous hope. And I guess the second piece is just seeing the young people who, even when politics seems dirty and ugly and brutal, they ran for office anyway. You know, they just got up and ran for office anyway. They're doing the hard thing. So the least that the rest of us can do is be out here championing them, supporting them, and helping make sure that they're successful. Yeah. Well, so this is my last question. What are two things everyday people can do in order to make sure these young people are successful or to make sure that we are continuing the good fight and organizing all the way through to the next election? And beyond. Right. Well, I do think one thing everyone can do, whether it's a young person in your life or maybe you're related to them, maybe it's your kid or your niece or your grandchild, I think it's a scary, hard time to be a young person. I think it's a really hard time to be a young woman. It always is to be a girl. And it's easy to forget how that feels. And So one really very specific thing I think anyone do is just pick a young person and just be their friend. And whether it's being a mentor, whether it's just taking them out for a soda and just talking to them about their life and what they need, whether it's, you know, encouraging them when they want to run for their, you know, class president or it's a you just never know the difference you can make in the life of a young person. I've just seen it over and over again. So that's one thing that everyone can do. And I guess the other thing is I'd say pick somebody who just got elected to office or maybe they just got reelected, barely, like Gina or somebody, I mean, or like Lena Hidalgo. And uh, I don't know, help them. Have a, have a coffee for them. Introduce them to some other people in your community. Because then the cool thing, you're going to meet other people that you want to know too, right? It all comes back to you in the great universe of organizing. But that's something I think it's easy after an election is over. Just go, whew, thank goodness. Now we can go make the turkey, have the Thanksgiving, do whatever we do. I just think it's really important to go, you know, this is the time to look around you and go, okay, who really made the fight? And maybe it's even somebody who didn't win, but is going to run again. That's something that really matters. I did fundraisers this time for people I really barely knew. And now they're part of my like world, right? And I, I'll do anything for them. And I think that's really important. And it'll make you feel good, too. Oh, all good advice. Thank yeah. you very much. I love to give advice. <laughs> well, Cecile, thank you very much for being on Future Hindsight. It was really, really a pleasure to have you on. It was great to be here, Mila. Thank you for doing this podcast and for giving us all like a way to focus our energies because that's how we're going to change this world. That's right. Thank you. Thanks. Cecile Richards is the co-chair of American Bridge, former president of Planned Parenthood, a co-founder of Super Majority, and author of the book Make Trouble. Next week on Future Hindsight, we're joined by Chris Melody Fields Figueredo, for a conversation about ballot initiatives, a big story out of the midterms. Chris is the executive director of the Ballot Initiative Strategy Center, which seeks to strengthen democracy by building a national progressive strategy for ballot measures. That's next time on Future Hindsight. And before I go, first of all, thanks for listening. You must really like the show if you're still here. We have an ask of you. 
could you rate us or leave a review on Apple Podcasts? It seems like a small thing, but it can make a huge difference for an independent show like ours. It's the main way other people can find out about the show. We really appreciate your help. Thank you. This episode was produced by Zach Travis and Sarah Burningham. Until next time, stay engaged. This podcast is part of the Democracy Group.